Hi everybody, welcome back. Miss Calabrese here. Uh, in this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, what can go wrong with your immune system, so immunopathology. All right, so immunopathology is when your immune system either overreacts or underreacts, right? The immune system is incredibly complex, um, so there are lots of opportunities for things to go awry. Um, so some things that would be signs of abnormal immune function are things like asthma, anaphylaxis, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, um, any kind of graft rejection or, or transplant rejection would be considered an immunopathology. Immunopathologies can be categorized as either hypersensitivities, so the immune system is overreacting to something, or hyposensitivities, which means the immune system is underreacting. Um, hyposensitivities are sometimes called immunodeficiencies, right? So, um, and those, uh, those immunodeficiencies can either be um, inherited or acquired. Right, so the main acquired immunodeficiency is AIDS, right? Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, uh, which is a result of long-standing HIV infection. Um, so after um, after HIV has run its course for uh, a long amount of time, uh, usually the T cells in a person um, get uh, the T cell counts get very low, uh, and if you don't have enough T cells, then you don't have those generals in charge of your immune armed forces, so you're not able to fight off. Um, just general infections that most people with a healthy immune system would be able to handle pretty easily. All right, we're mostly going to focus on hypersensitivities for this conversation. Um, so there are four basic types of hypersensitivities uh, that we just number type 1 through type 4. Um, type 1 are um, allergies. So that's kind of atopic, um, allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, asthma, those all fall, fall under the category of type 1 hypersensitivity. A type 2 hypersensitivity would be um, things like blood group incompatibility. So if, if you're given the blood transfusion with the wrong blood type, uh, that would be considered a, a type 2 hypersensitivity. Also pernicious anemia, myasthenia gravis, um, erythroblastosis fetalis, those are all type 2 uh, hypersensitivities. Uh, type 3 hypersensitivities are immune complex reactions. We'll talk about what that means in a second, but these, uh, these are things like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Uh, and then type 4 hypersensitivities um, are delayed hypersensitivities. These are um, things like contact dermatitis or graft rejection um, that are not quite as immediate a response. All right, so um, this slide here is just kind of an overview of what these four different types of hypersensitivities boil down to. Um, so again, type 1 uh, is uh, allergy, anaphylaxis, asthma, things like that, it's IgE mediated. Uh, type 2 is um, this cytotoxic hypersensitivity, so it's a, it's a complement induced lysis of foreign cells. We'll talk about how that works in a second. Um, type 3 is immune complex reactions, and then type 4 are T cell mediated delayed sensitivities. All right, so let's start with type 1, and we'll kind of get into the details of what all of these mean. So, type 1 is anaphylaxis or allergy. Um, so, and allergies are when allergen itself is just a, an antigen that your body is overreacting to. So, it's something innocuous. That your body is interpreting as being potentially threatening, right? So it's, it's kind of like it treats it as though it's infectious disease when really it's just a grain of pollen or a peanut protein or a strawberry protein or whatever it might be. So allergens are antigens that your body interprets as being dangerous um, because it's overreacting to them, All right? So and then allergic reactions can um, can range from being very mild, a little bit of itchiness, sneezing, hay fever, to, to being serious, uh, life-threatening um, conditions like anaphylaxis. All right, so who gets allergies? Um, a lot of people. Uh, so, so 10 to 30 percent is an estimate. That's probably on the low side because most people that have an allergic response here and there are probably not going to, to the doctor and, and reporting it. So, um, so uh, those are numbers are probably actually a little bit higher than that. Um, and those allergies are things like, you know, seasonal allergies, a little pollen in the atmosphere, mold spores, uh, things like that, and some food allergies, um, again, mostly are, are pretty mild. All right, so 
Uh, susceptibility to allergens uh, turns out can be inherited. So there's some genetic basis for susceptibility to develop allergies, uh, but not necessarily for the allergy itself. Um, so if you have a parent who has multiple different allergies, it's likely that you will also develop an allergy, um, but it, not necessarily the same ones, right? So just because mom is allergic to strawberries doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be allergic to strawberries, right? So, um, and the genetic basis essentially lies in the fact that uh, there are genes that link the amount of IgE um, that you produce uh, and also the reactivity of the mast cells in your body. And we'll talk about how IgE and mast cells are related here in a second. Okay, um, this hygiene hypothesis is kind of interesting. Um, and so there is a lot of evidence to support this, um, that because of the sort of overly sanitized hygienic environment that, that we live in, especially um, urban um, locations, uh, where we're in the cities and where everything's Lysoled and Cloroxed and, and, and alcohol to death, um, that we're not exposing ourselves to as many potential um, antigens as, as we normally would, especially, um, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. So since we're not doing that, um, we're not training our immune systems the same way that we historically did. Um, and so our immune systems get bored and they start to overreact to things that aren't actually dangerous, right? So this is the hygiene hypothesis that's saying having too few microbes in our environment during childhood um, is what leads you to, to develop possible allergies and asthma later on, right? So it's not something that, that happens necessarily later in life. So um, you should still definitely, you know, <laughs> clean your, your surroundings and, and disinfect when necessary. Um, but just as, as children, if you're not playing in the dirt as much and exposing yourself to as many um, uh, possible antigens, then your immune system might not be super well equipped to tell the difference between what's good and what's bad as you grow older. Okay, um, so different types of allergens and how they get into the body. Um, so inhalants are allergens that you inhale. So that would be things like dust or, or uh, fungal spores, pollen, things like that. Um, ingestants are things that you eat. So those are food allergies. Um, injectants are things that uh, get injected underneath the skin. So this is if you have an allergic reaction to um, something that's um, in a vaccine. Um, uh, for example, people that have allergies to egg sometimes react to to vaccines because uh, they, a lot of times egg is what's used to grow um, the viral particles to create the antigens in that vaccine. Um, uh, bee venom, uh, so getting stung by a bee or a wasp that has venom in it, that gets injected directly under your skin. Uh, and a lot of people are, are pretty allergic to that. Um, and then contactants are things that just touch the surface of the skin um, on the outside and can trigger a reaction that way. Okay, all right, so how exactly does type 1 hypersensitivities work? Um, it basically, this is going to be a reaction. There are three players in this reaction. The first player is going to be the actual allergen. So let's, um, let's pretend it's, a, it's a, a grain of pollen or something like that. So we've got some pollen that's entering into the body. Um, that pollen is going to be picked up by uh, some IgE antibodies. Right, so you're going to have IgEs floating around in your body. Some of those IgEs are going to be, um, they're going to match with the shape of that particular pollen granule. Right, so when the IgE and that pollen link up, um, then we have an antigen antibody complex. Right, so the IgE is the antibody, the pollen is our antigen in this scenario. Those two linked together form an immune complex. Uh, now, that IgE is going to anchor itself. It's going to interact with, um, with a basophil or a mast cell. Um, and basophils and mast cells, if you remember from our, our blood chapter, are filled with lots of granules. Um, those granules that are inside those cells contain uh, things like histamine and heparin. So histamine makes you really itchy, swollen. Heparin is going to increase the, the uh, diameter of your blood vessels and, and make you kind of hot and red. Um, so so the, the, it's a three-way reaction here where 
um, where a pollen granule or whatever the allergen might be interacts with the IgE. And then the IgE kind of docks onto a basophilar mast cell. And when the IgE does that, it causes the basophilar mast cell to degranulate, releasing all of those inflammatory chemicals uh, into the area. And that's what's going to be causing the allergic response. Okay, uh, so which of the following is not the result of an abnormal or undesirable immune function? So one of these things is normal, the rest of them are abnormal, right? And that's, that's, the, that's the normal one. So fever is a normal response that would not be considered uh, a, an a immune problem. Okay, so moving on to type 2 hypersensitivities. So type 2 hypersensitivities are dealing with, we're no longer dealing with IgE here. We're dealing with IgG and IgM, uh, and we're mostly, instead of looking for like small foreign um, antigens, in this case, the antigen is going to be a whole foreign cell, right? So we're looking for a whole cell that does not belong in the body. A lot of times these type 2 hypersensitivities are caused by alloantigens. So alloantigens are something that um, are, are different between individuals of the same species. Right, so normally when you're reacting to like, say if you're having a type one reaction, you're reacting to a totally different species, right? You're reacting to a peanut or a strawberry or, or a tree. Um, in, in this case, in the type two hypersensitivities, we're reacting to cells that come from another individual of the same species. Right, so, um, so and this is again, not necessarily an immune dysfunction. We want this to happen if if we've got foreign cells um, inside the body, our body should be reacting to that. So this can happen um, in transfusion reactions. So if you get a blood transfusion from someone that does not match your blood type and you have antibodies um, against their, um, their red blood cell antigens, um, then that would be considered a, a type two hypersensitivity. Right. Um, the other one aside from just the ABO blood group is the, uh, is the RH or rhesus factor. Um, so uh, the rhesus uh, blood group is, is just whether your blood type is positive or negative. So if you're A positive, that means you have A antigens and rhesus antigens. If you're A negative, that means you have A antigens but no rhesus antigens. Um, so it turns out about 85% of people in the U.S. have rhesus antigens or are considered Rh positive uh, on their red blood cells, and about 15% are Rh negative. Um, uh, and the, the only time that this really is going to cause problems is when an RH negative mother is pregnant with an RH positive fetus, right? So during that pregnancy, there is a chance for the, the positive rhesus antigens on that fetus to interact with mom's blood. If that happens, then she can begin to form antibodies against the rhesus factor. Um, and once she forms those antibodies, um, there's no way to get rid of them. So now she's got antibodies that are ready to attack her own fetus, uh, which is obviously problematic. Right, so, um, so, and again, this usually doesn't happen with the first RH um, positive baby of an RH negative mother. Usually it's the second one. So the first one is when you uh, is kind of considered your sensitizing dose, uh, where you're exposed to that antigen the first time and your body starts to begin to build antibodies. And it's the second dose that's considered provocative. So in this case, the second dose is the second RH positive pregnancy, um, where the, the mother is going to be making a whole bunch of antibodies against um, that fetus. Right? So, so in those situations, a lot of times those situations, if, if it's not treated properly, will result in, um, uh, result in a spontaneous miscarriage. Okay, so there, there is a way to prevent that. Um, uh, so there are, um, now we can inject ourselves with anti-serum um, that will prevent mom from producing antibodies against her own fetus. Um, so, and that those anti-serums called the Rogam, you get injected with it about uh, 28 weeks of pregnancy and then again at birth for every um, RH positive pregnancy, but only if you're RH negative mother. Um, and that just helps prevent this disease, which is um, called a hemolytic disease of the newborn um, if the baby makes it to term, and if not, erythroblastosis fetalis. Okay, there's that information about Rogam. So 
So um, it's just a, it's it's basically a passive immunization. So this is passive antibodies that are being sent to mom to prevent her making anti-RH antibodies. So to basically stop her making antibodies against a, fe a fetus, which would cause uh, problems to future pregnancies. All right, moving on to type three hypersensitivity. So these are immune complex reactions. So this is um, interactions um, between antibodies and antigens. Um, and in this case, uh, the body is doing normal body function. So normally we want antibodies to interact with antigens. Um, and what would happen next is once we have that antigen antibody immune complex, that then a, a phagocyte, a macrophage will come along and ingest um, those particles and clear them out of the system. Right? So that's the normal response. What happens in a type three hypersensitivity um, is that your body is producing way too many of them. So you have so many of these immune complexes that they start, start to kind of build up in the tissues, especially epithelial tissues, and settle down into basement membranes. Um, and as they settle down into these basement membranes, um, your neutrophils are still going to want to go after them, right? So they still want to attack these immune complexes. But once they're kind of sinking into the tissues, then the, the neutrophils are basically destroying your own tissues on their way to get to those immune complexes. All right, so yeah, it's just large, large um, amounts of these immune complexes that build up in the tissues. And it, the tissue that it decides to build up in is gonna determine what, what your resultant um, illness is gonna be, right? So if this is building up in the joints, for example, then that's how we get rheumatoid arthritis. Um, uh, with lupus, it can be a number of different places in the body. So this is just a buildup of these immune complexes that triggers um, neutrophils to just go haywire and start destroying your own tissue to try to get those immune complexes that have settled down into basement membranes. All right, so types of autoimmune diseases again. So there's a lot of these different types of autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are really, really common and that's because your immune systems are really complex. Uh, and when things are really complex, it's easy for, for stuff to go wrong. Okay, so concept check, and which one of these situations uh, would we need to use the Rogam shot? So think it through. Yep, so the only one of those situations where Rogam is needed is gonna be an RH negative mother, so a mother with a negative blood type, and a fetus with a positive blood type, right? Everything else um, will be fine. Okay, so the last type of hypersensitivity we'll talk about is type four. Uh, so these are gonna be different than what we've been talking about so far. So types one through three, um, we're basically on the B cell line or the humoral defense line, because we were talking about antibody reactions. Um, type four hypersensitivities are T cell medi mediated. So these are um, also sometimes called delayed responses because uh, symptoms don't necessarily show up right away. Okay. Um, so uh, infectious allergy counts as a delayed hypersensitivity. Um, so uh, for example, the tuberculin reaction. So if you've ever had a tuberculosis test and they uh, inject that little bit of antigen underneath your skin to see if you have a reaction to it, um, that would be a delayed hypersensitivity, right? It doesn't show up immediately. That's when they inject that. And then you have to go back to the hospital or wherever a few days later for them to read the test. Um, and similar skin reactions with others, uh, happen with other diseases as well. Okay, um, contact dermatitis is a type of type 4 hypersensitivity. Um, so contact dermatitis, uh, that's a pretty nasty um, particular case there in that picture, but um, this it, it happens in a similar way to allergic responses in that you have to have a sensitizing dose followed by a provocative dose. Um, so this is the case for things like um, poison ivy is a, is a good example. So if you, if you interact with poison ivy, your first exposure to that will not cause a response usually. Um, it's the second exposure uh, that's considered the pr provocative dose. So that first dose, you're sensitizing your body, your body's building up a sensitivity to that particular toxin. Uh, and then the next time you encounter it, your body is ready to go, ready to attack. So that's the provocative dose um, that you start to see these kind of um, contact dermatitis sort of reactions. Okay, so type 4 hypersensitivities um, can also show up as uh, graft rejection. 
So any kind of transplantation where you're moving tissue from one individual to another individual, um, there's a chance for rejection of that tissue because the immune system is going to recognize it as being foreign tissue. Um, so that's why uh, for any kind of like organ donation or tissue donation, there's an extensive amount of testing to try to make sure that the, the, the donor and the new host um, are a close as possible match to one another. Right? So we're looking at things like your MHC genes to see how close those MHC genes are to one another so that you're less likely to reject uh, that donated tissue. Okay, so we're looking for, for matching um, HLA class one and class two markers that are important for recognizing the difference between self and foreign. Um, so this is why when you need a tissue donation of some sort, it usually comes from your family because they're the ones that are gonna be most closely related to you um, and are most likely to share uh, similar MHC genes. Right? So we usually find matches in, in closely related siblings or parents. All right, so what happens if, um, if the match isn't close enough is that the host may reject the graft. So the, the new host body will reject that grafted tissue because it's gonna recognize the, the foreign MHC class one markers on the outside of those new donated cells and it's gonna start attacking them, right? So it'll send out cytotoxic T cells to go attack and destroy that foreign tissue. Um, and then eventually you'll start to form antibodies against it and that's gonna continue the damage. Uh, and eventually this leads to the destruction of the grafted tissue. All right, um, the, the other side of this uh, scenario is called graft rejection of host. So this is when the grafted tissue it has its own T cells and the T cells that come with the grafted tissue recognize the entire host's body as being foreign. So that graft rejection of host um, is, is more of a systemic problem. And this usually just comes from bone marrow transplants. So remember that the T cells are made in the bone marrow. So if these immature T cells are made in bone marrow and you transplant that bone marrow, um, now that new person has T cells that are being developed um, that are going to recognize that whole person's body as a foreign antigen. Right? And so this is called uh, graft versus host disease where the grafted tissue is attacking the entire person's body, um, where you get this terrible peeling skin rash, there's a lot of um, toxic effects, um, and it takes a long time, right? Because it takes a while for those T cells to mature to the point where they're recognizing the body as being uh, foreign. So this is one to 300 days. All right, so here's kind of an image to visualize what's happening in these two different scenarios. Um, so in host versus graft, so you get a kidney transplant, for example. So we put a new kidney um, inside the host's body. That kidney cell is going to come with its own MHC class 1 markers. Um, and then the host's own T cells are going to recognize that kidney MHC1 as being foreign, right? We know that that, that didn't come from our body originally um, because it's got a different MHC1, right? So that's going to that's gonna trigger... Um, a slow moving response, right? Because now we have to develop um, all these new um, uh, T cells that are ready to attack that foreign uh, cell. Uh, in the opposite situation in graft versus host, um, now we, the T cells are what's being grafted. So the T cells are coming from, from donor blood, uh, bone marrow. That donor bone marrow um, has these immature T cells. When those T cells start to mature, uh, and they start to find their way around the body, what they're gonna find is that every single cell in this body is foreign to them, right? So it's basically the grafted tissue rejecting the host tissue. Okay, all right, so uh, so this is, yeah, this is mostly for bone marrow tissue. Um, so we try for bone marrow transplants to get the closest possible um, um, MHC. So you're really looking for a very, very close match. Um, so that you don't have this kind of problem, um, but but even with really close matches, it's it's a, it's usually necessary to treat the the patient with chemotherapy and whole body irradiation to destroy the patient's own blood cells. Um, and a lot of times, the patient will switch over to becoming the blood type of the of the donor rather than maintaining their original blood type. Okay, so a few different types of grafts here. 
um, and, and kind of the risk associated with them. So an autograft is when you're just transplanting tissue from one part of your body to another part of your body. So you're it's transplanting your own tissue. Um, so this happens a lot with like skin tissue, for example. Um, you can stretch out an area of skin in one part of the body, then cut that skin out and transplant it to another part of the body for burn victims. Um, so autografts are super safe, right? Because the MHC is a perfect match because you are yourself. Um, an isograft is also a very safe type of transplant. Isograft is only for those uh, lucky enough to have an identical twin. So if you have a, a genetically identical twin, then you can get an isograft from them and there should not be any rejection problems because again, the tissue is genetically the same. Um, most uh, transplants and grafts are allografts. Um, so this is between two different individuals of the same species. So your brother gives you a kidney, that's an allograft. Um, you get a, like a, a, a cadaver bone or cadaver cornea, that, that's all allografted tissue. Um, xenograft is when you take tissue from a different species. Um, so this, for example, um, uh, if you've got a pig valve in your heart, that's a, that's a xenograft. All right, so quick concept check here. Um, so match these different types of graphs uh, with the description. I'll give you a second to read them through there. All right, so there's your answer. An allograft is a graft between non-identical twins. An autograft is a graft within an individual. An isograft is between identical twins. And a xenograft is between different species. All right, so I hope this was helpful to your understanding of immunopathology. Let me know if you have any questions.